Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Their success, their reputations and their reaction. Some leaders have. Um, do you want to go on? Some leaders have uh, have divided a team and a country. Other leaders have divided opinion. Other leaders are maybe just disillusioned with their their leadership, or delusional. Others we have deemed to be almost like a saint, or almost ready to get a knighthood. And I'll let you work out. Which ones are which? It's interesting to see the different fortunes of these leaders, different types of leaders. One is hailed as a new model for man, a new role model for man, and hailed as this new type of servant leader, which I kind of thought, well, that's interesting, because I knew a servant leader. I know a servant leader 2,000 years ago who was advocating this style of leadership. What's changed? But no, it's been interesting seeing people. But these phrases, I don't know if you've noticed phrases that have been used this week. Be brave, they've been over the last few weeks. Exceeding expectations, conquering fears, overcoming fears. All these phrases. Whereabouts have you heard the phrase, be brave? In fact, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? I was thinking about this. I think the bravest thing I've ever done is uh, my daughter has just passed her driving test a few months ago. I tell you, the bravest thing I've done is sit in the car next to her as she's been learning to drive. Not just because you're out of control, but it's like, she used to be like this, and now she's like this. We all have times that we have to overcome our fears, and we have to be brave. Words that resonate, maybe it's the first day at school, come on, be brave. Maybe it's in a sports match, come on, we can do this. Be brave. Fill your potential. When something hurts, be brave. Or that first swimming lesson. We all have fears, don't we? Mine is heights. But also, we need to be brave in terms of faith. How many times, if we're honest, do we wonder, where is God? Where is God? We read stories of great leaders, Moses, Abraham, Joshua, Elijah, And maybe we ask ourselves, where is the God of Elijah today? Where is the God of Elijah today? I remember when I first became a Christian, reading the Old Testament, reading the New Testament, and it just blew my mind that suddenly there would be a phrase, and God spoke to, or someone talked to God, and they heard God's voice. I was thinking, why? Why can't hear, I hear God's voice? Do we hear God's voice like that? Where is the God of Elijah, the God of Moses? Where is that God? The God of Moses who overcame his inadequacies and his poor communication skills to lead people. The God of David who overcame the odds and the giants. The God of Esther who risked her own life to save her people. Almost a Holocaust scenario. And the God of Elijah, a bit of a loner, lived at half time, but he just prayed. They had one thing in common, and that was being brave. It was a kind of common theme. They were dedicated to God, but they were committed to being brave. Dedicated to God and committed to being brave. And I thought just for the next little while, we'd just look at one of those characters, look at the, the character of Elijah. I'm trying to think, where is the God of Elijah? So if you've got your Bibles, if you'd like to turn with me, just to read about the context of Elijah arriving on the scene, you can find it in 1 Kings chapter 16, starting at verse 29. 1 Kings chapter 16, starting at verse 29. It says, In the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took as wife 
as a wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his younger son, Sigub, he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, son of Nun. Then 17 starts off. And Elijah the Tishbite in the inhabit of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years except by my word. So Ahab, we learn, was yet another king in the line of many who did evil in the sight of God. Deliberate disobedience. And then Elijah, Elijah, the Tishbite, was the first in a long line of important prophets that God had sent to Israel and Judah. In those days, Israel had no faithful kings throughout its history. Each king was wicked, leading the people in worshipping pagan gods. Even the priests who were appointed by Israel's kings were corrupt and ineffective. With no king or priest to bring God's word to the people, God called prophets to try and to rescue Israel from its moral and spiritual decline. For the next 300 years, these men and women would play vital roles in both nations, encouraging the people to turn and leaders to turn back to God. See, Elijah was up against it. It was against a multitude of Baal worshippers. Those who believed in Baal, who worshipped Baal, believed he was the God who brought rains and bountiful harvest. So when Elijah walked into the presence of this Baal worshipping king and told him there would be no rain for several years, Ahab was shocked. Let's just imagine this story playing out a little bit. Imagine the bravery of Elijah just to go up to the king. I mean, it wasn't, it's like today, you just can't go up and knock on Buckingham Palace and say, I want to tell, I want to tell the queen a message. So you imagine uh, Elijah, he knows he's heard from God, and um, he says, okay, with everything within him, he's overcome his fears, he's being brave, and he marches up down to where the king's kind of palace, you know, all the tents are everything. And he walks up there, and then first of all, he's got to get past the guard. And he announced himself, my name's Elijah the Tishbite, and I've got a message for the king. And the God looks at him, up and down, as gods do. And he said, well, you can't just go and tell the king a message. You've got to give me the message. He said, I can't. The message is from God, and I'm the only one who can deliver it to the king. So he looks up and down again. And he turns around, and he walks off, and he goes to see the king's courtier, the king's personal assistant. And he says, there's a guy out here called Elijah. He says, it's a Tishbite. The king's court, he said, what's a Tishbite? I don't know, he said, but he's out here. He's got a message for the king. Well, can't you get the message? No, he said he was only delivering the, the message himself because it's from God. So the king's court here thinks, well, I'm, I'm a bit intrigued as to what a Tishbite is as much as anything. So he said, okay, bring him in. So the guard went back, got Elijah. Elijah went up. My name's Elijah the Tishbite, and I've got a message for the king. And the king's PA said, what's a Tishbite? He said, I'm a Tishbite. Why can't you give me the message? I'll give it to the king. No, I've got to give it to the king myself. And there was this sort of like eyeball contact standoff as Elijah the Tishbite looks at the king's courtier. I've got a message for the king. And eventually the king's courtier thought, oh, okay. So he goes up to the king. He knocks on the king's sort of like, tent wall. It says, Sire, there's a guy out there called Elijah. He's a Tishbite. The king said, what's a Tishbite? I don't know what a Tishbite is, but he's out there. He's got a message from God for you. Now, at that stage, you've got to realize that Ahab, knowing he was disobedient, was getting a little bit nervous when he, he, he thinks about a prophet from God is going to come and give him a message. And he's trying to weigh this up. What does he do? How does he react? And he says, well, I've got to hear this message. It might be good because we're in a drought. It might just be. He said, well, I'll hear the message, but just because it's a tish bite, I want to find out what one of those are. So the king's courtier went out. He gets Elijah. He introduced Elijah. He said, here's the king. 
Elijah bows. He said, my name is Elijah the Tishbite. The king said, what's a Tishbite? I'm a Tishbite, he said, and I've got a message for you. When I say it's going to rain, it will rain. And when I say it won't rain, it won't, won't rain. Thank you, good night. And he turns around and went. And the king was just there. Okay, that was a Tishbite. And then Ahab trying to, trying to process this message. You see, he had built a strong military defense. But it wouldn't be any help against the drought. He had many priests of Baal, but they couldn't bring the rain. And Elijah bravely confronted this man of power, this man who had led his people into evil. And he told of a power far greater than any pagan god. He spoke in the name and of the name of the Lord God of Israel. See, when rebellion and heresy was at an all-time high in Israel, God responded not only with words, but with action. Where is the God of Israel? Where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of Elijah? I remember when I was, uh, when I was in Leeds and we were doing up our house and uh, we were, it was great because uh, loads of people used to come and help us. And there's one night I was just scraping walls or painting and a, a guy I got to know, a good friend of mine, uh, he called Martin. And we were just talking about things of faith. That was a great thing about doing up a house. And you heard everybody's stories, their house stories, their DIY tool stories, but also their faith stories. And Martin had just got back from a, a, a trip to India. And he said, John, John, I just can't understand. I see the God in, 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 uh, in um, India, and I see uh, people come up, and I've seen healings. I've seen scales fall on their eyes. And then I got back here, and we're talking about co- coffee cup rotors and who's going to put out the flowers. And we argue about hymns and things like that. But where is the God that heals? Where's that healing God? Where's that powerful God? I guess, where is the God of Elijah? And we used to have sort of dialogue, you know, what is it? What is it about that? Why don't we see those things? And I guess we could be intimidated by thinking, how can we be like, like Elijah? He's a mighty man of God. He was a mega prophet. But Elijah was just devoted to God. He was deeply concerned and grieved by the idolatrous behavior of his people. Elijah knew that God's wrath towards Israel behavior was long overdue. Elijah just wanted to make a difference. But he recognized that he was just a youth and powerless to do anything about it. He had no influence, no pulpit, no money. To him, it seemed as if there was nothing he could do but pray. Nothing he could do but pray. But in James 17, James chapter 5, verse 17, we do learn a little bit more about what... And it explains what Elijah was like, as well as being a Tishbite. Let's have someone just to help me. I need someone just to help me preach. Have we got a volunteer? It's not hard? Go on. I can pick on someone. Who fancies doing it? Let's pick on one of the worship team, this guy here. Come on. Let's give him a round of applause. Just for checking the week. Just introduce yourself to me. Everyone else knows you. Andrew. Great. This isn't rehearsed, is it? No. So are you feeling nervous now? No. No? I'm a Tishbite. You're a Tishbite? (laughs) There's always one, isn't there? Okay. I I thought I'd I'd write it out quite big. So all you have to do, do you need glasses? No. There you go. Okay. So we're going to, we haven't rehearsed this, so it could go, but he's a worship person, so it'll be fine. Okay, so uh, just, uh, if you just want to start reading out, and then I'll be good from the, from the top, please. Elijah was a human being. Okay. With a nature... No, su- no, 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 stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Elijah was a human being. Are you a human being, Andrew? I am. Are there other human beings out there? Hands up if you're a human being. Great. Some of you aren't so sure. So, so far, you and Elijah, you share one thing in common, which is... We're a human being. You're a human being. You and Elijah, just alike. Carry on. With a nature such as we have. We're the nature. With uh, uh, uh. <laughs> My gig. Andrew, yep. without this turning into a counseling session, have you ever done things wrong? Absolutely. Ever sinned? Yes. Ever messed up? Do you think Elijah messed up? Mm-hmm. But he must have got that nature. So, so far, we're all human beings. We have a nature just as, as Elijah had. Hands up if you think you're a little bit like Elijah. 
Some of you still aren't so sure. Maybe you're the non-sinners up here. Great. Okay, carry on, Andrew. With feelings. With feelings! Okay. Got any fears? Any hurts? Yep. Any doubts? Anyone ever been angry before? You think about Elijah. He was this mighty man, mighty man, uh, mighty man of God, mighty prophet. Yet, as soon as he'd given this message to Ahab, the king, then he was running for his life because a woman scared him. Well, that's, yeah, that's fine. But you know what? He had, he had feelings. He had different sort of doubts. He had anger. He had hurts. Are we like Elijah? That's great. Carry on. With affections. And affections. You got affections? I do. Anyone in particular? Everybody. Ah. I thought it was going to get some gossip there, but it didn't work. <laughs> Carry on. And a constitution like ours. And a constitution. Do you need food, air, and water, Andrew? Yes. So therefore, we're both human beings. We're all human beings. We have a nature. We have feelings. We have affections. And we have a constitution. We need, we are physical people. We need air, food, and water. How alike are we to Elijah? Very. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Give it up for Andrew. Oh, carry on, yeah. <laughs> and he prayed earnestly for it not to rain. And no rain fell on the earth for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and the heavens supplied rain, and the land produced its crops, as usual. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Give him a round of applause. So people may ask, where is the God of Elijah? But actually, should we be asking, where are the Elijahs of God? We've heard that actually Elijah was just a human being. He did mighty things. He was a mighty man of God. He was a mighty prophet. But actually, we are just the same as Elijah, you and me. And if Elijah's with that sort of like makeup that he had is the same as ours, and he prayed and it make a difference, surely that means that our prayers can make a difference. Doesn't it? So we can pray for these people that Paul mentioned before, and we can expect God to move. We can pray for situations in our country and expect God to move. Maybe he doesn't answer the prayers in the way that we want him, but God will move. We can trust God. We can make a difference. You know what? God is simply looking for people to be available and obedient, to be prepared, to be brave, to pray as though everything depends on us. And work as though everything depends, sorry, to work as though everything depends on God, but work hard as though everything depends on us. Pray that as though everything depends on God, and work hard as though everything depends on us. You may, um, some of the uh, more uh, mature members may uh, remember a a little um, event that we had called Ninth Hour uh, as Youth for Christ. And years back when it started, we, um, uh, we used to run these uh, events over in uh, Whitley Bay. And uh, one night we had, a, uh, we had a speaker lined up, and it was kind of a January time. And, um, uh, and uh, snow was all around, and this guy was traveling from quite a long way, so uh, he just couldn't get through. So with about an hour's notice uh, of this, you know, and you've got sort of like, you know, a couple of hundred young people there, um, it was like, what? What are we going to do? So obviously you just, you just worship, you know, Ken Riley, here I am. You know, kept going. Um, we were trying to think, and we, we sort of like prayed and then listened to God, and we felt that you know, God was calling us to, to share a few things, and we would pray for some people uh, that, that you know, maybe hadn't got a faith and were become Christians, those that are maybe uh, uh, struggled and were backsliding, the prodigals, we pray for them. And also we felt God was saying, pray for healing. And so we divided it up. There was a few leaders there, and one person took the hand, and, took, and they said, John, you can pray for the healing bit. And so you imagine we had the worship time and then we had a little bit of sharing and someone said, anyone want to become a Christian? Yeah, that's fine. Anyone really go, oh, want to come back to God? Yeah, we're fine. And then I was to stand up and so we feel that God is laying on our heart. Anybody who needs particular healing, you know, come forward and we believe in a God of healing. A God, you know, when we pray, things happen. And, uh, you know, the sort of faith man that I was, so I stood there and there was a, a few, there was a, a couple of people come forward and, you know, being in charge with my clipboard. Because that's the anointing in the clipboard, isn't it? You know, and um, I was saying, "Well, you can pray for him. You pray for her." And then there was just one person left, and everyone seemed to be busy. And God was saying, "You've got to pray for him." I said, "No, no, I've got the clipboard. I've got to organise things." 
no, no, you've got to pray for him. No, no, there must be someone else far better than me who without a clipboard, pray, pray, pray. But no, there's no going away. You know, God was saying, you pray for him. So nervously, I put my clipboard down. I thought the anointing might have gone when I did that, but I put my clipboard down and approached this guy. I said, hi, can I, can I pray for you? I asked him his name. His name was Neil. And um, uh, he explained that he had a, 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 you know, a bad shoulder and he was about to go to the doctors the following day. Uh, to, you know, for consultation and expecting, you know, he was going to have an operation and everything. It was all quite well down the line. Now, I related to uh, dislocated shoulders because my wife, Liz, sort of had a real problem a number of years back with uh, dislocated shoulders. So I kind of, you know, I knew which sort of sympathetic oohs and ahs and words to, to, to say and questions to ask. So, um, I, you know, I asked about it and I said, would you mind me laying hands on your, your shoulder? Yeah, no problem, he said. So you yeah, did that prayer and sort of like, you know, all these questions and doubts are going through my mind. You know, there's a young person here. And what if God doesn't answer my prayer? What if God is not here? What if, what if, what if? And all these doubts. And he sort of lay and I said, please be here in the name of Jesus. Thank you and good night. I looked at him and he, he just went back to his seat. I thought, oh no. And all these doubts. Even when I went home, I was thinking, oh no. Because he didn't say he felt anything. And yeah. Maybe God, maybe God doesn't heal. Maybe I've led someone astray. Maybe I don't know. Oh no, all those doubts. It was the following day, the next, the next morning, I call, got a call from one of the organizers of the event. He said, John, John. I said, yeah, yeah. So that's how you do it on the phone. John, John, don't you? Anyway. Um, John, do, do you remember praying for a guy called Neil? I thought, oh no, this is it. They've made a complaint and he's, he's lost his faith just because God didn't answer my prayer. And oh, what a sinner I am and wretched me. And oh, and you know, you're feeling... And he said, I just want to say, it's just rung me. And he's, uh, he's been to the doctors and his, his shoulder is completely healed. Well, you could have slapped me across the face with a wet kipper, you know. But it's not about me. But that was God working in. And if God can use my prayers, a feeble, weak, sinning me, doubting me, then surely God can use ours and yours. It's just about being brave. It's just about maybe overcoming our fears. It's about taking a, a step forward. Elijah the Tishbite, his prayers, our prayers can be effective. We can have the same power as Elijah, but we've got to be brave and maybe we've got to overcome our fears. As I said before, my fear is a fear of heights. I'm starting to feel nervous now. I might get a nosebleed. And um, every year I try and overcome these fears. I, I go on various, uh, I'm going on a school trip this week uh, to um, Lightwater Valley, you know, and they say, John, you've got to come on the ultimatum. And I went, yeah, and I hate it, and my stomach goes all funny. But my biggest thing when I was trying to sort of cope with this fear of heights was I was preaching at my church in Leeds when I was w- working there. And at the end, you know, you do that obligatory holding, you know, shaking hands and thank you, very nice. And, you know, this guy came up to me and started chatting and said, John, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, I think I'm having a day off and spending it with my family. He said, would you like to come up in my plane? I own a 10% of the plane. Well, two things came into my mind straight away. First of all, which 10%? Uh-uh. And also, there's nothing I want to do less than go up in your plane. It's like a two-man, four-man plane. What? Uh, yeah. So I said, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure, really. I, you know, I, I'll, uh, I'll, can I get back to you? Thinking, if I have a few hours, I'll be able to make up an excuse. And I went back home and I said to Liz, I've got an invitation to go up on a plane. What can I do instead of going? And I, hi, you know, so I'm okay on the big ones, you know, because it's just like being on a bus. You can't see, but a little one, you know. I just couldn't think of any excuse. She said, go for it, you know. Oh, no. So I phoned him up later. I said, David, I'd love to come up in your plane. Sorry, God, I lied. I'd really like, you know, thank you for the invite. So anyway, he picked me up the next day and he drove me to, to Leeds Bradford International Airport. And we, we walked across from the car park and um, we were going past all these big, really classy, shiny looking planes. And he said, it's just over here. And I saw this, oh, this mega one. It was really nice. You know, it's just, it's only a small, but it looked really the bomb. He said, I thought, we're going up in this one. We're going up. And it's just round the corner here. And we went there, and it was this little, you know, tin can with a couple of things sticking out the end and two seats in it. Be brave. Overcome your fears. I tell you, I never prayed as much. 
And uh, I was sitting there alongside him, and it started to do up. And, and actually, you know, it was exhilarating, I must admit. It was great. And I even had a little drive, if you drive planes, I don't, I don't you know. And it was great. You know, sometimes we have to put ourselves in a position where we overcome our fears, where we have to be brave. If we want to have that same faith as Elijah and the, the heroes of the faith in the Bible, then we've got to step out and be brave. James at chapter 5 there, it just says, The prayers of a righteous man and woman, they are powerful and effective. And Jesus made us righteous when he died for us on the cross. Our sin for his righteousness. You know, tomorrow starts a, a week of prayer initiated by Premier Radio called Peace on Our Streets. And it's a call to pray focusing on the epidemic of violence that we've seen of late, especially for the young people involved in a backdrop of violence in streets, on the streets and in communities. You know what, we can come up with plans and policies, but actually there's a point that we just have to start praying. And prayer is the tool that makes a difference. And we can know, because we're like Elijah, and Elijah's prayers were answered, we can make a difference. It's been quite significant over the last 18 months that uh, um, Youth for Christ has upped his strategy and upped his, his commitment to praying for situations. The breakthrough we've had in terms of finances and, and young people coming to, to know Jesus and a growth of centers has been phenomenal as we've committed to pray. Maybe this can work. Maybe we can make a difference. But how many times do we press forward rather than praying into? How many times do we just decide a way rather than devoting the way? How many times are we guilty of playing at being God rather than praying to our God? But maybe, maybe God is just calling us to be brave, to speak out, to stand in the gap. Maybe, maybe we can make a difference. We've got on our side. Maybe we can make a difference. Why? Well, we can be faithful because God is faithful. Maybe we can help bring that hope because God is our hope bringer. We can be made whole because God is the healer. We can be set free because God is our liberator. So maybe we need to stop asking, where is the God of Elijah? And start asking, where are the Elijahs of God? Where are the Elijahs of God? People are going to stand in the gap. Because we are similar to Elijah. Maybe there's something we can do. Maybe there's prayers we can pray to make a difference. There was a story of um, a youth for Christ working. He was in touch with uh, some young people. And... um, uh, they, they'd been at something like Spring Harvest and they were all fired up and they got back to their school and they went up to the headmaster and they said, we want, we, we want, to, uh, we want to form a Christian union in the school. And the head, who didn't have belief at all, said, no way. So they thought, I left it a bit and then went back to him the next day and knocked on his door and said, excuse me, sir, we would like to, to start a Christian union because we are Christians and we want to pray for the school, we want to have a Christian presence in the school. And he said, no. And he went back a third time and he said the same answer. He was getting slightly annoyed and he said, no way, over minded body, there's going to be a Christian union in this school. And one of the girls stood up and said, we are going to pray every day that you either change your mind or God changes you. A few months later, the guy had to resign. And the girls were looking at each other, thinking, oh, What's happened? So they're really expectant. The new head came in at the start of the term. And um, so the, the, uh, the girls went up and said, uh, uh, Miss, Miss, um, we, we're Christians and we would love to start a Christian union in the school at lunch times. And she said, No, no, we can't do that. I'm sorry. So they thought, Well, it's you know, early days for a, you know, we'll go back next week. So they went back and said, Miss, Miss, I wonder if you uh, if you thought about it anymore, because we would really think it's important that we have a, a Christian union for ourselves, for our Christian friends, to pray for the school. We can pray for you. And she said, no, no. So um, one of the girls were pretty brave. He said, do you re- realize what happened to the last? A few weeks later, this head found out she was pregnant. And sort of like moved on. A third head came in 
And the girls thought, well, you know, they were starting to get really brave this time, you know. So they marched in and said, sir, you might have heard that the last two heads have uh, have, uh, left. It's because we prayed. We would like to start a Christian union in our school. And you need to give us permission. And he just looked at them. He said, well, that would be fantastic. I'm a Christian myself. Then uh, let's give you a, uh, which room do you need? Do you need any resources? You know what? Just some 13, 14 year old girls were brave, kept on praying and made a difference. They were brave, overcome their fears and made a difference. We can be brave with God on our side. We can be brave with God. God's just looking for us to be brave, take steps of faith and obedience. And, you know, it's important that we, you know, we have this big God on our side. And the little bear had just sort of spent so much time that he knew that if he roared, something would happen. But actually, it was when he stepped out, it was his father that made the difference. There's times that we need to be brave and just step out. How are, how are we going to be brave? Actually, it's just about knowing God. Knowing God, knowing his word, getting close to God, turning our face to God, listening and basing our life on the truth, cultivating helpful habits that work so we know God intimately and we walk with him. And when we do that, when we're walking in step, like the great heroes of the faith, when we're walking in step and in tune with God's heartbeat, then we'll recognize opportunities. And we'll have the bravery and the faith to take them. And then we'll see the fruit. We stay close to God. We recognize opportunities. And then we'll bear fruit. Because that's what we're called to do. But it starts with us. With little steps. Being brave. Let's pray together, shall we? Holy Spirit, we want to acknowledge you as God. Lord, we can, uh, we can stand up and tell stories and not need you. We can play instruments and not need you. We can invite our friends to things and not need you. We do loads of things and not need you. But actually, it's you that makes a difference. So, Lord, forgive us when we try and do things on our own strength. Holy Spirit, we want to be a brave people. We want to be obedient people. We want to recognize the opportunities you're putting in front of us. So, Holy Spirit, equip us. Holy Spirit, turn our ordinary conversations into extraordinary opportunities for people to come to you. Turn our ordinary friendships into extraordinary opportunities to make a godly difference in people's lives. Take those ordinary tasks or jobs or things that we do into extraordinary times of fellowship and obedience and mission. And Lord, help us to know the same way that you said uh, and you promised to answer Elijah's prayers, the same way that you work through people like Elijah, you promise to be and work through us. So Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, equip. Holy Spirit, lead. We ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.